All right, so we left off talking about uh, sessions. And uh, I had a little inspiration after class, and I thought, you know what? You could do a UUID with HMAC. And then you'd have even more security. So what would that look like, and why would it give you more security, and would you want to use it? Doing both at the same time, uh, wouldn't you get some sort of security overlap? Say more. Somewhat. Um, with just assault, it would be just, it would be, yeah, it's as if you just have a longer UUID where half of it, it depends on the other half. I beg your pardon? So, so it's, it would end up being like you've got one bigger UUID, because you got whatever UUID, you make it. You run it through your HMAC, you're always going to get the same thing out. So it ends up like it's just one bigger ID where half of it is dependent on the other half. What, a, what would that prevent? How would, would it prevent anything by having a UUID that gets HMAC? So here we have HMAC, and, uh, and what we're passing in is email and code. So that's the cookie value, right? And so it's based upon the email, and then we get some hash right here. And when we get it back, we could run it against the email again. And if we get the same code, then we know that nobody changed the cookie. So if uh, we used, instead of email here, a UUID, then we would know whether or not somebody changed the UUID. Or if, they, if somebody's just like creating UUIDs and sending them to our server and hoping <coughs> you know, that they'll capture somebody's session. So I, I don't know, that might be a little bit of overkill. What do you think, Daniel? Would that be overkill? Uh, for most purposes, that would be overkill. I think maybe like a bank would want to go for it, but majority of sites, even something like Amazon, probably wouldn't need that much. So you're just validating that the UUID came from you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what you'd be validating. So that's just like so one more really thought I had. Want, if you want it to be really secure, you could add a pepper, as it's called. You have the salt and you have the pepper. So the salt is per website and the pepper is per user. So you'd have your HMAC key there. Maybe sep if you, uh, right now you've got your, when the cookie is some value pipe, the HMAC uh, code hash. What if you put some value Type some random number or something that's your per user uh, key pipe, some other thing, and combine it with your user with your uh, per website uh, key. Yeah, so there's ways that you could make it even more secure. For all purposes, if you're using HTTPS, a UUID is good. good yeah. yeah, it's usually, good. Usually good enough. All right, so let's look at HTTPS. So uh, HTTPS is based upon TLS. It used to be SSL, so you can Wikipedia those. And uh, we have uh, handle funk at root, and it runs handler. Handler right here sets the header, content type, text plain, and then just writes, this is an example server. That's all it does. Right, and uh, we're printing to the log go to HTTPS localhost or HTTPS 127.0.1.0.1.1043. And 443.10.443 is the port because uh, 443 port is the port for HTTPS. I'm just looking for that <coughs> port HTTP 443 port number HTTP. HTTPS. So we're just saying 10443 because this is, you know, like not a live server. Like we said, localhost 8080, and 80 is often the port is the port for HTTP. Okay, so we are saying in development localhost 8080. And now we're saying in development localhost 10443 because 443 is the port for HTTPS. 
and over TLS or SSL. So TLS is the new SSL, just like 45 is the new 25. <laughs> okay, so you want to use TLS. Yeah. Um, so what exactly is, um, you probably explained it in your big speech right there, but um, what exactly is this code doing? Is so it HTTPS has a lot of stuff that's going on, and I don't know all the intricacies of it. Well, I mean, what, just, is, what is the program doing? Your service the one web page that says this is an example server. Up yeah. At the top there. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so before we had stuff like this. I guess. Handle funk, listen and serve 8080, nil. Default serve mux, right? So handle funk, listen and serve 8080. That's all familiar, right? So now we have handle funk, and then we're just printing a log out to tell people where to go to, to run this. And uh, we're using HTTP list, listen and serve TLS. So we, used to, we were using HTTP listen and serve, and listen and serve returns an error, which we have not been handling. But in this one, I could have also just done this. And maybe this is a better first example, so let me change it. How's that look better? So before we were using handle funk listen and serve port 80 nil default serve mux. Now we're using handle funk listen and serve TLS port default serve mux nil and we're passing in cert and key. A certain a key. Does that help? We'll find out. Okay. Do you want to see the documentation, anyone? Take a gander at that. So we could go look at the documentation before we run this. So we have those two. What type is cert file? Certificate. Yeah, what type? What's it? Ty it's type. No. Is it uh, some sort of? Uh some sort of, I want to say some sort of file that states that this website is what it says it is. This game's called The Truth Will Save You. Raise your hand if you do not know the type of cert file. Okay, cool. So in Go, you could do, I'm, those aren't declarations, are they? Are we declaring that these parameters are of a certain type? They are declarations, right? So we have declarations, address, cert file, and key file are all string. So the cert file is a string, key file is a string, address is a string, and handler is a handler. Address is a string here, and handler is a handler there. Address is a string here, and handler is a handler here. And by the way, cert file and key file are also strings. So those are all of type string. And they return an error. 
So we go look at it. Uh, listen and serve TLS acts identical to listen and serve, except that it expects HTTPS connections. Additionally, files containing a certificate and matching private key for the server must be provided. If the certificate is signed by a certificate authority, the cert file should be the concatenation of the server certificate into any intermediates and the CA's certificate. <laughs> a trivial example is pretty much what we're going to be looking at. Right, that's the exact same code that we just had. I love that they give you that text, uh, that text wall up there, that mini text wall, and then says a simple example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Go sometimes is like a trivial example, and it's like, whoa, I can't understand that. <laughs> sometimes. So to get a certificate. A signed certificate, we'll see that in a second, but basically to generate a certificate on your machine for development, you could run this code right here. So Go has a program, and so we're going to say Go run, and we're going to look to the Go environment variable root. And so if you are in uh, Windows, you do want to surround that with parentheses, with uh, percent signs instead of uh, dollar sign parentheses. So for Unix environments, it's dollar sign parentheses gives you environment variables. In Windows, it's surrounding with, with uh, percents on both front and end. Really? So go env go root gives me this. User local go. That's where my go is installed. Source crypto tls generate cert dot go. And then I pass in this uh, variable, host is equal to some domain name. So for example, host is equal to localhost. If this was a domain name, I would put in here, well, I'd be getting my certificate from somewhere else. Because this isn't being signed. So I could get rid of these right here. And I could go, what is it? There we go. And uh, 036. One. And I could get this code. Correct, right? <clears throat> yeah, should be. So Windows may have issues with the uh, go env go root being inside there, but that would just be a limitation of Windows. Is there a particular reason we're using go environment? And because go, it go root does not necessarily exist. If, if your go installation is on the default location for your OS, you do not have to set go root in your global environment variables. Hmm. I've always done it by hand, so. <laughs> so I copy that code, paste it in, and let's see this actually come up. There's nothing there, right? Run it. Instead of giving environment, you can direct give the complete path. Yeah, if you want the full path, that would work too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. So now I have certain key. <clears throat> Let's just put that in the notes for people. Yeah. I mean, that's always the case in any situation. You're going to be using an environment variable. You can also use its actual path because mm -hmm. all it is is for our intents and purposes an alias. Notes, notes, notes. All right, so I have that. Now I could run this. 
So it's running and uh, it says I need to go to 10443. So if I go to localhost 8080, nothing. But if I go to 10443, import and not used, log. Try that again. Go to localhost 8080. Nothing serving there, right? Wrong port, wrong protocol. 10443. Your connection is not private. Attackers might be trying to steal your information from localhost or whatever the website is. For example, passwords, messages, or credit cards. Net error, cert authority invalid. My certificate's not signed, right? <clears throat> PIM encoded chain. Begin certificate, end certificate. Hmm, interesting. Automatically report details of possible security instance to Google. <laughs> Advance. The server cannot prove that it is localhost. Its security certificate is not trusted by your computer's operating system. This may be caused by misconfiguration or attacker intercepting your connection. Proceed to localhost, unsafe. By the way, huh? Okay, we'll, we'll just proceed. This is an example server, okay? And it's no longer HTTPS because the certificate's not signed. Rather, it is, it is HTTPS, it's but it's not trusted, it's, so yeah. that's not secure. For all you know, there's some other computer in the middle uh, act faking being the website. I sent you an email about that. Uh, I don't know if I can talk to you about that, but look at HTTPS. It has a uh, connection hijacker in there. That oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah but I've seen that. <laughs> I laughed for like three minutes straight after seeing that. So if we uh, click on this, you could read a little bit more about it. Identity of the website's not been verified. Server certificate's not trusted. Certificate information, right? Self-signed root certificate. Details. Acme Co. Okay. Uh, stop using an invalid certificate. Your connection is encrypted using modern Cypher Suite. Connection uses TLS 1.2. Connection is encrypted, so that's green. We just don't have a signed certificate. Zero permissions from the site. Site settings, we can look at that. Could Acme be invalid? We grew up with Acme. <laughs> <laughs> stop using an invalid certificate. So then it goes back to this. Right, so if you wanted to ever get back to demonstrate to people the screen, you just, and then I could proceed, but then I could say stop using an invalid certificate, and then it won't let me actually see that page. So uh, how do you actually get a SSL uh, certificate, free SSL certificate? And there's start SSL. And so lots of companies charge a lot of money for signed certificates, but once an organization becomes uh, there's a list of organizations which can sign certificates. I think there's like a thousand of them. Organizations which can sign HTTPS certificates. Certificate authority, right? I don't know if there's a list. Industry organizations. Certificate authority council. Anyhow, there's a lot of them, and uh, so here, here are some of the top ones. Komodo, 41%. But once you're certified to sign a certificate, who cares who signed it? And so Start SSL can sign certificates. They're in Israel, and uh, they've got a better website now. So they don't look quite so janky. But here's like their free version, right? Or $59 or 120 So you might check out Komodo and see what they charge. SSL certificates. Free SSL certificate, sweet. 90 day validity. Multiple subdomains, multiple servers. Ideal for one domain. 
99 bucks a year, but only for the next seven hours. Act quickly. <laughs> and I bet you tomorrow it'll be the same countdown. Yeah, That's not too bad. 100 bucks a year. If you really want funny, you'll find stuff like Google signs their own certificates, mm -hmm. and Microsoft signs their own certificates. So you go to an HTTPS website for Google or Microsoft, and you look at their certificate, who signed their certificate, they, they signed it themselves, but they're on the list of the overall authority, so they're allowed to. So there's the certificate. I don't know what the heck that means. Anybody have any insight into that? Just an encrypted certificate? Mm -hmm. And the key is what? So if I was actually to buy one, I'd get a cert and a key also, or I'd just get a cert? You get both. And uh, the key, just never look at the key, right? Yeah. yeah it's a public-private key pair. So it, whoever, whoever's connected to your website can get your cert just fine. And you've got the connecting key. So anything encrypted with either one can only be decrypted by the other one. So when I send something to HTTPS, the key is used to encrypt it? Yep. And then I send the cert with it to the person, and they're able to use that cert to unencrypt it. Yep, but when they're sending like passwords to you, they use the cert. Encrypt, encrypt it, password. and then that allows me to un my key allows me to unencrypt it. Yes. So that's a asymmetric keys, right? Yes. Two different keys, basically. Yes, but I believe they actually use a kind of a thing in the middle, um, where uh, you send your certificate out to the user or to the client. The client sends like a big jarbled string of random stuff back to the server, and then the encryption is based off of that random stuff instead. That way the server can send stuff to the client without anyone else being able to listen in because everyone's got to start. Pretty cool. So you got to be HTTPS to use HTTP2. So pretty important. So this example just shows uh, error handling, which we haven't done before with HTTP listen and serve. Do you have any thoughts on that, Daniel? Should we be doing error handling on listen and serve? I mean, if you don't listen and serve, your application doesn't run, so you might as well just die, right? It, it, and if you don't do that kind of error handling, it'll just do the line. It'll return an error, which gets dropped, and then it goes to the next line, which ends the program. So if you don't actually catch the error there and print it, you don't know what the error was. So uh, that's a good practice, then, so you can see why is it not serving. Yeah, so you get, get the error. error could just be that you got someone else already using that port on your computer. So good to add if you can't get it to serve. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Yeah. Pretty much. I don't think this is a good place to introduce it. Eh, I guess it's fine. What's this file do? So this one allows you to have both a uh, server running on localhost 8080 and then also on uh, localhost 10443. And uh, yeah, so Go is uh, how you do concurrency. And so we're launch launching another Go routine right here. And so that's going to normal code execution just flows through main, comes to the end of main, ends, right? And it goes sequentially. So it runs whatever it hits. Well, when it hits this, it sends that off to go run in its own Go routine. And, uh, and then it launches this one. So we have two servers running. And this one just redirects. So if somebody tried to come in on port 8080, they get redirected to... 10443. So, so, so uh, it, it's running another thread, basically. So you got both. So uh, normally you call a function, your whatever is calling that function waits until that function's done and gets back the return value. If you say go something, it goes off and that function's done, and your own your original function moves on at the same time. So there, there are ways to make it communicate. Go's got its own. New tests and locks and such. We've got channels, which are Go specific, which are primarily designed for message passing between Go routines. But but Go Go is designed for the multi-processing like that. Um, actually, Listen and Serve actually uses separate Go routines for every request that comes in. So 
it would be stuck on that server because that server is sitting there listening. So here I have main with two go routines. Foo and bar, they're each going to print to 45. When I run this, nothing happened. Because main said, okay, go run that in its own go routine. Go run that in its own go routine. We've got three threads running, three go routines running. We have main, this one, and that one. Main exits, the program shuts down. Interesting. So we could do a weight group. And we could say weight group, we're going to add two to the weight group. Wait until they're both done. So go this one, go that one, wait. And then these run, and hey, I'm done. And now I'm done. And weight group has package level scope, right? So it's uh, accessible within each of these functions. So now when I run this one, bar, foo. Interesting, it ran bar before foo. The compiler figures out on its own how to sort of make things execute. Instead of weight groups, I could do time sleep. Sorry, I'm still using weight groups, but I'm going to pause inside each loop let me pause for 3 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds in that one. So we're going to see different routines printing to standard out, running at the same time, illustrating concurrency. So you see they're interleaved some. And... Uh, Foo finished first because Foo is only waiting three milliseconds and Bar finished last because every time Bar is 20. And so Bar and Foo and then Foo, three milliseconds, six, nine, 12, 15, and then Bar prints again, which is waiting 20, right? One, two, three, four, five, 15, and then Bar, which is waiting 20. Kind of interesting how it works out. All right, so uh, the next thing that we have here is a photo blog. And uh, I'm not going to run it until this other process is done. But we're getting a temp pointer to a template. So TPL is of type, a pointer to a template template. I'm getting that type because when I do something like parse glob, I get back a pointer to a template, right? Or if I parse files or parse, right? I get back a pointer to a template. And so that's from, in the documentation, godoc text template. And we have a Parse files and parse glob, they both give back a pointer to a template. So there's type template, type template, and it comes from package template. So from package template, give me a template and make it a pointer. And the reason it needs to be a pointer is because when I parse files or parse glob, I get back a pointer to a template. So here I'm going to parse those and get back a pointer to a template and store it in that variable. And I'm using Gorilla. So sessions from Gorilla, new cookie store, the secret password, and then the store. And then a couple of handling funks, so just handling different paths, different routes. Root, login, log out. 
and uh, handling assets in file server. So the strip prefix deal. And so if I look in my directory here, I have assets, I have images. And I'm getting rid of the fav icon, HP not found handler. Listening and serving on 8080. Contacts clear handler. We saw a little bit about that when we looked at Gorilla briefly. So what happens at index when you come to index? Store.get from the request, the session. So that's just part of the Gorilla deal, the store. I don't, I'm not a real big fan of Gorilla. I kind of like the way we were doing it with cookies, but that's the way this was built. Then we authenticate. We're just storing a value logged in. See you, Jose. So we're storing in our session values, which is like a, I think it's a map. Session values, map, interface, interface. So session values logged in. The key is logged in. We're setting the value. If it, we're checking to see if it's equal to false or if logged in is nil. If so, redirect to login. And then we have uh, something here that will request a form file. So request form file. And we're passing in data. So that means we must have a form somewhere that uploads. And I think we parsed in a template. That's why I talked about pointer to template. Index. So here I have a form. And uh, am I using ID anywhere? Not. So I just need name. That's the name of the variable, which is going to be submitted. Post. So through the background, through the form, as the body, not through the URL, which is what Git would do. And, uh, and so we're uploading a file. And that's why we have ink type multi-part form data, so we could upload a file. And when we upload a file, right here, request form file. And what's the name of the data that's coming in? It's data, and the name of the file that's coming in is data. And if we look at request form file again, Godoc and uh, request form file net HTTP. Type request. Where did I find that? Request form file. So if you know Daniel, Daniel knows, don't answer. Who else has suggestions? Form file. There we go. Type request. We have a request. The request is right here. Each request is pointer to an HTTP request. When we have a pointer to an HTTP request, we have these methods. We're requesting form file. Takes a key, gives us back a multi-part file, file, multi-part file header, and an error. So we got a source, header, error. Source, header, error. So that's the source file, multi-part file. If request method is equal to post and error is equal to nil, upload photo. So we have a function upload photo. Upload photo takes source, multi-part file, header, multi-part file header, session, pointer to session, session. Pointer to a sessions session, where sessions come from. Right here, sessions, new cookie store, gorilla sessions. So the type is from this package, this type. Pointer to a session. When we look at new cookie store, new cookie store gives us back a pointer to a cookie. 
That's our store. Why do we need pointer to a session session where a session's used? That's the session, and where are we passing that in? It's upload photo. We're getting session right there. We're getting session from store.get request session, and then we store it there. So with upload photo, we're going to defer closing that file, and then we're going to get a SHA of that file. So it'll just be the SHA, get SHAs right here, this function. So we pass in, we're passing in the file, SHA1 new, and then copy the source, that file, to the SHA, and then do the sum nil and return that, gives us back a string. And then we're adding JPEG to that, so getting unique file names. This is actually something Dropbox might utilize, because if many people are uploading the same file, let's only store it once. And then we'll just remember these 10 people all have that same file. And then when the last person deletes their usage of it, we'll delete the file, but we're not storing 10 copies of the same file. Right, so it's just a unique way to get a name that's unique to that file. Remember what Shaw's kind of do is black box, put something in, you get the same output. All right, we saw Shaw 256 and did that with uh, the Golang download for the program. So we get the file name, and then we get the working directory. So OS get working directory, and then we join together the working directory assets, images, file name, right? So that gives me on this machine assets, images, right? And then that, I'm going to be putting the files right there. So working directory, assets, images, join, joins those together into a file path. And then we create, OS create, and we pass in that path. So OS create gives us back a pointer to a file. So we're creating a file, which is at that location. And then we're going to defer the destination close. I have to do a source seek. The source is the source file that's been uploaded. I have to reset the, what is it, the read head? Source seek resets the read head. It's the offset for that reader write to. So this was just something that when I first created this, it had a bug because source had already kind of like done the read write head towards the end of the file already. And I think that happens right here when I do the SHA. So I had to reset that back to the beginning and then copy the source to the destination. And then I have add photo. F name is the name of the photo and to the session, All right? So I'm adding the photo to the session. So add photo takes in the file name and then the session. So data get photos, pass in the session, gets all of the photos that are stored in the session. So create a slice of string, get session values data, gives me JSON data. So data is used twice, that's not the best, but this is referring to what's stored in the session, the data of the files. And uh, gives me back JSON data. And if JSON data is not nil, I'm going to unmarshal the JSON data into that slice of string and then return that data. So I get back a slice of string right here. I'm going to append to that slice of string this file name. Then I'm going to marshal that back into JSON. So I get a byte slice. And I'm going to turn that byte slice into a string and store it back into session values. So I'm keeping a list in values of all the photos in my session. So we got there because we started it off with upload photo, which was in right there. I save the session and uh, I go get all the photos, get photos, and pass in the session. So get photos, we already saw that, gets that string of photos. And then I, that's my data, and then I execute my template and I pass in that data. 
So my template I have a, a logout. I have image source assets images 01. I've add photo and a form and I range over the data that's been passed in. An image source assets images and then whatever the new photo is or all of the photos so it prints out all the photos. And then the last template page is a uh, login page. So login takes a username and a password. I'm not using ID there. And uh, that's it. Submit. And then we have log out. So store git, get the session, session values, logged in is equal to false, save the session, redirect back to logged in. Let's see how our process is running. <clears throat> so it's done. It took, huh? Oh, thanks. Oh. So computers see the world through the eyes of madness. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so this is just an example. I know that there's some code in there which is uh, foreign and new and, and convoluted, but I think it's a nice example because you guys have gotten the pieces. Granted, it's a stretch at this point, but you've gotten the pieces to understand that. And when I was walking through that code, you might have been a little bit like, whoa, 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 but it's not outside your reach. And with a couple of hours of meditation on it, or even 30 minutes, you, you'd get that code. And you could even refactor that code to not use Gorilla. That sounds like a good homework assignment. <laughs> and a challenging one, right? Because then you really got to sort of think about all those pieces and then start doing that with just cookies. So I, I like that homework assignment. So let's watch it run. Because when the book and the bird differ, believe the bird, the bird, not the book. And uh, it's always good to see it run. Um, do you have to go back one more? I think I'm, uh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. And it's just, uh, yeah, thanks. just that's it. Localhost. So username, password. I need to get a few images. Hold on. Surf. Search tools, size. Well, hell, I've got the little thumbnails right here. It's funny, they've uh, re -changed, they've changed this. We've got landscape images now. I need to do the usage rights, able for reuse. Okay, there we go. We'll save this one. Uh, save image as uh, 01. And... Save this one, save image as 02. And we'll save this pretty cool image. Save image as 03. So that image was already in there, right here. And now, I could go to uh, choose a file, <coughs> and I put them on my desktop, and 01, open, submit, <coughs> choose a file, put it on my desktop, 02, open, submit, choose a file, put it on my desktop, 03, open, submit. Pretty cool. And if I look at those files, they got a SHA-1 hash for the file name. That's a SHA-1 hash of that file for the file name.
which would actually be more, be more secure than using the files file name. Someone could edit their package to make it look like the file's file name is actually dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash windows slash boot and uh, mess up your system. If you, uh, but since they're doing this, it doesn't matter what the file's actual name is. So if you, if you uploaded a file name with that stuff and it executed it? It, it could, they they could, could upload the file wherever they want if you uh, were if you were just oh. naively just use the file name. Oh right. You can't actually name a file right. like that because you're, that doesn't work that way in the file system. But if someone just like edited the package, like specifically made the HTTP package to act as if that was the file name, and sent that to you, oh. and you just use the file name, they could put have it technically uploaded anywhere, if, except for not using their file name. They say it is. We're using what we generate the SHA-1 algorithm. So anytime that somebody uploads anything to you, you need to SHA-1 it or something so that you're not using their file name. That's cool. How many people uh, like that? Cool. How many people feel like that homework assignment would be too much for you? Okay. Really? You got the code. All the code's right here. It's all right there. And we're using Gorilla here to do our session. But instead, I'm going to have you just do UUID. So you just look at how do you do a session with UUID, pull out the parts, or put in the right map. parts. The way you're using the session, you need to, you're putting file names into the cookie. So oh, yeah, you that's HMAC, true. Not UUID. That would be more challenging. You create some other data structure and just store the stuff in that data structure. I'm just saying HMAC is just you, you use HMAC instead of UID. Yeah, that might be challenging. Do you think it's beyond them? <laughs> a little bit challenging. Please say yes. 